While woody invasive species like bush honeysuckle and buckthorn get plenty of attention online and in other media, there is a group of invasive plants that can be just as problematic, even harder to control, and are common in more urban settings. The invasive vine. Due to many invasive vines having explosive growth rates and characteristics that make them tough to control, they can become a problem quickly once introduced into an area. Here are 12 invasive vines you need to watch out for, starting off with the Asiatic wisterias, of which there are two species that are invasive in North America, Chinese wisteria, wisteria sinensis, and Japanese wisteria, wisteria floribunda. The Asian wisterias have been planted widely as landscape plants because of their showy, fragrant purple flowers. Unfortunately, the Asian wisterias escape cultivation easily and thrive in a wide variety of conditions and can quickly spread through native plant communities and are found over much of eastern North America. There is a native species of wisteria, the American wisteria, Wisteria frutescens, which is an excellent alternative for the invasive Asian species. Next up is an invasive vine most of us are familiar with because it is used extensively in landscaping and is best known for covering the walls of old brick buildings. Of course, I am talking about English ivy, Hetera helix, which is easily identified by its star-like, evergreen, lobed, waxy leaves. There are actually a few species in the genus Hetera that are problem invasive vines. But English ivy is the most common and most widespread. Due to English ivy's long use as a landscape plant, both as a climbing vine and as a ground cover, it can be found causing problems in native plant communities of all types and is a huge problem in urban areas. English ivy can climb and cover trees just as easily as it can cover a building and can eventually smother and kill trees or cause them to break due to the weight of the vines. Another invasive vine with a long history as a landscape plant is winter creeper, Euonymus fortuni. This waxy, evergreen vine has been planted widely in landscapes due to its toughness and glossy, evergreen foliage. Unfortunately, it escapes cultivation with ease and can spread at warp speed once it is introduced into native plant communities or disturbed areas. It is a tough vine to control, and if left alone, it can quickly cover the ground, shrubs, and trees, smothering everything in its path and basically forming a monoculture of winter creeper. This is a common invasive in urban areas. And almost every yard we have done consulting work on has had a winter creeper infestation. There aren't many places in eastern North America where winter creeper isn't found. If you love learning about invasive species so you can spot and remove them from the native plant communities around you, be sure to tap that like button to support backyard ecology native plant content. Introduced into North America in the early 1800s as an ornamental due to its showy flowers, for erosion control, and as a wildlife plant, Japanese honeysuckle, Lanicera japonica, has become an invasive nightmare across much of the eastern U.S. This evergreen vine can quickly overwhelm native herbaceous growth, shrubs, and trees, and the tough vines can girdle and kill saplings as they climb up them. Monocultures of Japanese honeysuckle are unfortunately quite common. Even though it has little value to wildlife and is invasive, Japanese honeysuckle is still sometimes sold for wildlife habitat purposes and used as a landscape plant. Another vine that was introduced in the 1800s is Asian bittersweet, Solastris orbiculatus, which was brought to North America as an ornamental for its showy, persistent red-orange berries that hang on through the winter and also for erosion control. Unfortunately, it is still sometimes planted as a landscape plant, like other vines on this list, Asian bittersweet easily escapes cultivation and can grow unimpeded in native plant communities. This is a big, thick, heavy vine, and the weight of it can break or uproot trees as it climbs up and covers them. It is also a long vine and can bridge from tree to tree in the forest canopy, which can cause multiple trees to be pulled down at once. Infestations of Asian bittersweet can be found throughout the eastern U.S. There is a Native American bittersweet, Solastris scandens, that is well adapted to our native plant communities and should be planted more than it is. Autumn clematis, clematis turnifolia, is yet another vine introduced into North America as an ornamental due to its showy clusters of white flowers and is still sold as a landscape plant today. It is highly adaptable and can grow in a wide variety of conditions, which when coupled with its high production of small, wind-borne seeds, make it a fast-spreading invasive which can colonize new areas far from the mother plant. Autumn clematis forms dense mats that smother native herbaceous plants, shrubs, and even small trees. It can be found throughout eastern North America. There is a native clematis, virgin's bower, clematis virginiana, that is an excellent alternative to the invasive autumn clematis.
You may have noticed that every vine on this list so far was brought to North America as an ornamental, and they are still being sold today, which warrants five out of five on the Picard face palm scale and brings up the question, why are we still selling invasive plants? I wish I had a simple answer, but I think it comes down to a lot of things. From there, what we have always used, to ease of propagation, to people buy them because they know what they are. So how do we fix the problem? I don't have the answer to that one either. All I know is it's probably gonna be a very long process. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. I would love to hear them. If you thought we were done with vines introduced as ornamentals, nope, we still have a couple. Chocolate vine, Akebia quinata, was introduced to North America in the mid 1800s as an ornamental and for its purple fruits, which have a sweet edible pulp. Unfortunately, chocolate vine escapes cultivation easily, and since it can grow in full sun to shade and in just about any soil, it can spread quickly. This is another vine that can create dense mats that smother native herbaceous plants, shrubs, and trees. Currently, chocolate vine is found in scattered locations throughout eastern North America, but it is spreading. Due to its explosive growth and adaptation to a variety of conditions, it is one to watch out for if it is not already in your area. Yet another invasive vine brought here as an ornamental is Japanese hops, Humulus japonicus, a cousin of the hops that are used in beer brewing. This vine is more commonly found causing problems in the northern half of the eastern U.S., especially in the northeast, but can also be found in the south. While Japanese hops can grow in a variety of conditions, it is most often found in riparian zones and bottomlands, where its explosive growth can form a dense mat several feet thick, covering and wiping out all other plants in its path. It has enough mass that it can break smaller trees as it overtakes them. This vine has a high seed production and several thousand Japanese hop vines can be found growing in a single acre in severe infestations. The porcelain berry, Ampelopsis glandulosa, was introduced to North America as an ornamental for its brilliant, almost psychedelic colored berries. Birds love the berries and help to spread this vine far and wide. While it isn't as widespread as some of the vines on this list, it can be found across the eastern U.S. and where it is established, it is a major problem. This is another vine that is a big problem in both urban and rural areas and can be quite common in some urban areas as it is still being sold as a landscape plant. This can be a large vine and it has a similar growth form to our native grapes and can easily overtake shrubs and trees, smothering them in the process. There are two native alternatives to porcelain berry that are also a huge hit with the birds. The pepper vine, Ampelopsis arborea, and the heartleaf pepper vine, Ampelopsis cordata. I would like to take a second to thank everybody who has supported the channel by subscribing. I really do appreciate it, and it does let me know that the content I am creating is reaching the audience it is meant for. I would also like to give a super huge thank you to all those who support the channel financially through our Patreon, PayPal Donate, and YouTube Super Thanks. The channel would not be possible without you, and we here at Backyard Ecology are truly thankful for you. If you would like to join them in their support of Backyard Ecology, our Patreon and PayPal Donate are linked in the description, and you can give through YouTube Super Thanks by clicking the heart with the dollar sign icon right below this video. Thanks again for the support. And finally, at number 10 on this list, we get to a vine that wasn't intentionally introduced into North America. Asiatic Terrathumb, Persicaria perfoliata, aptly named for its barbed stems. Before I go into discussing its traits, I just want to say that the ornamental plant trade did have a hand in introducing Asiatic Terrathumb into North America. It arrived here as a contaminant in a shipment of holly seed from Asia. This is an unusual invasive vine in that it is an annual and dies every year, and the next year's plants are all the result of seed production. Don't let this fool you. This is still a terribly invasive vine, and its one season worth of growth is still more than enough to smother and wipe out vast swaths of native plants. Asiatic Terrathumb is currently mostly found in the northeast, but it is steadily creeping west and south. Next, we come to the Chinese yam, Dioscorea polystachia, a vine that was introduced into North America for culinary and cultural purposes in the 1800s. It is a triple threat when it comes to spreading, as it can spread by seed, by sprouting from its large tubers, and by forming small aerial tubers in its leaf axles that can drop off and start a new vine. Chinese yam can be found across much of eastern North America and is most often encountered in disturbed sites with moist soil. 
It isn't the longest of vines, but its high reproductive capacity gives it the ability to form dense, heavy mats that easily shade out native herbaceous plants, shrubs, and even trees. I am giving a very brief overview of these invasive vines in this video. If you would like to see a deeper dive into any one of them, just let me know in the comments. And now we come to the king of invasive vines, kudzu, Puraria montana best known as the vine that ate the south and a known invasive for decades. Originally brought to the U.S. in the late 1800s, it was not really established until the 1930s when it was widely planted for erosion control, forage, and even for shade and as an ornamental. It didn't take long to see that the explosive growth rate of kudzu, up to one foot per day in peak growth in summer, that made it great for erosion control and as a forage crop was a huge problem. Kudzu can cover a lot of ground quickly with a dense, large-leaved mat that totally shades everything underneath it. It is a great climber and has no problem topping the largest trees, which it will shade completely and eventually kill. It also engulfs utility poles, power lines, buildings, and anything else that's in its path. Kudzu is found mainly in the southeastern United States, although it can be found sporadically in the Midwest. There are plenty of great native vines that benefit pollinators and wildlife, and to learn about three of them that have showy flowers and are loved by hummingbirds, check out this video and be sure to get out and explore nature in your backyard.